Good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Benjamin Gadan. I'm the director of the Latin America program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm delighted you're participating in today's dialogue. Bienvenidos y gracias por su participación en la conversación de hoy. I'm thrilled to be hosting the latest dialogue in our Argentina Project's Argentina y Lije program, a series of high-level conversations about the policy ideas of the top candidates in Argentina's presidential election. Next month, on November 19th, Argentina will choose its next leader in the second round of its presidential election. Voters will choose between the Peronist finance minister, Sergio Massa, and the libertarian lawmaker, Javier Millet. Millet was the top performer in Argentina's open presidential primary in August. Massa, however, finished first in the first round of the presidential election earlier this month. He received 37% of the vote, followed by Millet with approximately 30%, and Patricia Bullrich, another conservative opposition candidate who received 24%. So far in this closely watched and high stakes election, public attention has largely focused on the candidates' economic policies. And that is not a surprise. Argentina is suffering from triple digit inflation, negative growth, crushing debt, and a dramatic scarcity of hard currency worsened by a historic drought. Polls reveal deep pessimism about the direction of the country. Views about the state of Argentina have not been this negative since the 2001-2002 economic collapse. In presidential debates, there has been little debate about Argentina's place in the world, its relationship with its neighbors, and broader role in Latin America. But this election could do more than reshape Argentina's economic strategy. It also holds the potential for major changes to Argentina's role in international affairs. Malay is a relative newcomer to politics in Argentina, and he has brought to his presidential campaign a radically different vision of Argentina's friends and foes in the international community. To give one significant example, both Peronists and center-right governments in Argentina have pursued ever closer ties to China, the top consumer of Argentina's agricultural exports and the source of billions of dollars in infrastructure finance over the last decade. Under the current president, Alberto Fernandez, Argentina joined China's Belt and Road Initiative and requested and later received an invitation for membership in the China-led BRICS bloc. By contrast, Millet has questioned the importance of China to Argentina, promising not to pursue new relationships with communist-led countries, and suggesting he was not interested in accepting the invitation to be part of the BRICS. He's expressed similar sentiments regarding neighboring Brazil, an indispensable partner for Argentina's industrial companies. Now, it is, of course, not clear whether and how these preferences would translate into national security and foreign economic strategies under a Malay government. To understand how they might is precisely why we have invited today's speaker, Malay's senior foreign policy advisor and his likely future foreign minister, should he be elected, Diana Mondino. Diana, welcome. Thank you very much. And quite a challenging introduction. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite finished yet. Okay. Diana joined us earlier in this series to discuss Millet's economic agenda. She recently won a seat in Argentina's Congress in the first round of the election as part of Millet's La Libertad Avanza party. As I mentioned, our expectation is that our guest today would be Argentina's foreign minister, should Javier Millet be elected president. For now, she serves as director of institutional relations at the Universidad del Sema in Buenos Aires, which I had the privilege of visiting a few months ago. We're so grateful she's here. We're grateful to our partners at McClarty Associates and its regional director, Kezia McKegg, for helping organize today's discussion and previous events in Argentina y Lije, and to my colleague, Beatrice garcia Nice for her support. Two very quick programming notes, and I promise we'll get straight to our conversation. I want to mention that our next dialogue in this series will feature Sergio Massa's senior foreign policy advisor, Gustavo Martinez Pandiani. So please stay tuned for details shortly after this event. And I want to let you know that I welcome your contributions to this dialogue as well. You can submit questions throughout this conversation in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. We'll be monitoring it closely and sharing your questions with our special guest. Now I can turn to our questions for you and welcome you again. Thank you for being here. I want to start just where I ended uh, that introduction, which is on the question of 
broadly speaking, what Javier Millet's foreign policy would look like, what his international priorities might be, and in a minute, I'll ask some more detailed questions about China, but I thought I'd like to give you an opportunity to kind of shape the, the conversation and tell us you know, how you and how Javier Millet see the world and Argentina's place in it. Well, we hope we can open up the economy, meaning that so far we have been retrenching from the rest of the world for many decades now. Actually, there's kind of a mantra among economists and among the people that the national things are better, it's not a, the equivalent of a buy American, but the, let me say it in Spanish first, vivir con lo nuestro. We can live on our own. And that technically, well, may be good, but you will not be living very well or as well as you could. No, you are leaving a lot of resources behind. You are leaving money on the table if you're only considering living only with your own, on your own. That's, uh, that's been kind of a, an economic sin because it's a, it's a real waste. We're trying, we hope we will be able to open up the economy. Having said that, we want to be a liberal democracy in, and that entails two different things. And before answering your question, a, a democracy is the way or the criteria by which uh, you decide who is in government, decide who is in power. And the liberal part is putting limits to that power. That is something that Argentina will have to start having back again. We used to have it. We do have a democracy. It's actually 40 years this year of the last, uh, of the first election after a military coup, our last military coup. And um, we have had <laughs> a system of not so much of a rotation among different parties or among different leaders, but a mm, very peaceful or simple way of having elections. However, there is very, uh, our checks and balances need significant improvement. And when I say significant improvement, that's a real understatement. Um, if we want to become a real player in the world, we also have to respect our own checks and balances. We have to respect our own differences in, um, in, in everything that we are not doing right now. Having said that, we will uh, approach the world from a, a variety of perspectives. Of course, exports and imports. Exports right now are severely curtailed, imports even worse. What do I mean by curtail? I can go into the details later, but we punish our exporters. And our importers, um, surprisingly, are benefited, which is kind of weird because uh, you shouldn't be doing both things at the same time. If you want to have your own industry, uh, you want to have uh, far better salaries for your own employees, you cannot uh, subsidize importers, which is absolutely insane as compared to what I was saying before. Uh, let me do it right now. Exporters have to tend in their dollars to the central bank. They cannot keep it on their own. They have to do it within a very short period of time which makes uh, a lot of uh, exports almost impossible because sometimes you it, it takes about six months to be paid and you have to bring back the money very soon. The government decides uh, how many pesos you will be getting for those dollars. And on top of that, you have a, a taxes. So uh, for exporters, it's really difficult. And at the same time, there are uh, constantly two and four mm -hmm. and who can export what? As we speak, for example, kosher meat cannot be exported. And as you know, anything that's biological, particularly meat, particularly the very complex process for kosher production, takes four, five, six years. And now it has been produced and the government says, I'm sorry, you cannot sell it abroad. Uh, I have many examples like that that I, I might give you. At the same time, importers uh, have a lot of difficulties uh, for getting their dollars at the um, the official, what we call the official exchange rate. There are over 19 different exchange rates in Argentina. So uh, not only because you need to stabilize the economy, you need to get rid of that, but also if you want to be dealing with the rest of the world, you have to be make it simple for other guys to understand what you're doing. There's no way to have foreign direct investment with that kind of system, etc. If and when, we are able to stabilize the economy, it will be because we are opening into a lot of other arenas, particularly 
uh, full respect for international law, very important, everything related to human rights, many things related to, related to other uh, areas that we are not uh, fulfilling right now. Of course, that if we put our focus on being integrated to the world, it is not only because that's the right kind of thing to do, but also because it's good business. If you export more, you can grow. But to export more, you need better infrastructure, you, you need a, a different kind of educational system, etc. So that helps you put priorities where you put your resources, our scarce resources. That also puts a very important focus on Argentina debt. Argentina is always flirting with another default, it's close to number 10. Uh, present government is doing everything in their power to make it very hard to pay debt. And well, if you want to be a, a responsible partner of other countries in the world, we must pay our debts. And uh, again, if you focus on being a, a reasonable member of the international community, then there are lots of things that are obvious what you need to do. And lots of discussions internally or domestically disappear. So having the right kind of focus can help you make decisions. On another thing, I mean, multilateralism is obviously the, the answer we can deal with. And uh, we need to start working on a variety of other issues, like, for example, um, trade deals. We have very few trade agreements, actually only one, Mercosur, and there's a lot of other ones that are, uh, we are talking about making them, but not there yet. For example, Mercosur with the uh, European Union, with EFTA and, and Asian, but we, we do not have a coalescence uh, within Mercosur. And Argentina has kind of relinquished its responsibilities there. Brazil is leading the way. And well, of course, many of our issues are the same, but not exactly the same. Just as a side uh, note, uh, Mercosur is four countries, Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, and Uruguay. And Paraguay and Uruguay uh, were two countries when, when this agreement was signed 30 years ago. They were smaller participants um, in the international arena as regards exports, but now all four countries export the same. It used to be that all Argentina could export uh, cereals or meat, and now all four of us do. And we have an external tariff that's 14% that makes no sense for Uruguay and Paraguay to pay. Because why would they? They are not trying to develop their own industry. And Argentina uh, has miserably failed in developing its own industri industrial sector based on that common tariff. So that's something that creates a lot of noise. Uh, when and if Mercosur has its act together, we are willing uh, to open up to all these other further agreements like the EU. Can it be done? Well, we were very, very, very close a few years back, I mean, four years ago. It has to be later approved by each individual Congress. We know that it, it will take a lot of time, but we have to start. That's something that's unbelievable. Or double taxation agreements. Do you know how many double taxation agreements has Argentina? Very, very, very few. Um, how can you expect to have foreign, foreign direct investment if you, you don't have a, um, a tax agreement? We do not have agreements as regards education for our students. You know, we have a very good uh, university, university system, a high, uh, higher grade education. Mm -hmm. And students from all over the world come to Argentina to study. They get a degree. And then when they go abroad, they need to do a lot of other things again. Uh, so it's recognized. I mean, for medical students, for example. And you say, well, medical students is always something very complex or perplexing. But OK, uh, we need to work uh, towards those things. And the other thing that Argentina should be hopefully doing is using our soft power. It's not only soccer. We have music. Uh, we have a, a pope. We, we have a lot of things. I mean, you cannot use them. But if some people are actually uh, on the other kind of saying, how come 
there are so many individual talents in Argentina and such a completely disarray on our institutional arena. So again, taking the lead from the foreign relations arena, we should start doing things that make it more, a, a more stable um, institutional framework. You would say, you should be doing that on your own. Yes, of course, but we have failed miserably in the last 70 years. So taking the lead again and using OECD, use another kind of agreements as a way of imposing on ourselves uh, a lot of discipline should work. Other countries don't need it. We do. I want to talk more about this idea of integrating Argentina more closely in the international community. And you've given a lot of examples that I'd like to dig into over the course of our conversation. But the most obvious one that would move in conflict with that vision would be distancing Argentina from China. And this is an area where I heard sort of different mis messages from the candidate and, and from you in the campaign. And I know it's on a lot of people's minds. So I thought we should we should start by talking about Argentina and Definitely. China. The, That's the, the yeah, so the, the, re the remark that a lot of people point to, and there have been other comments similar, is, is when Javier Millet said, no solo no voy a hacer negocios con China, no voy a hacer negocios con ningún comunista. Uh, not only am I not going to make new deals with China, but I won't work with any communist country. And I know you've clarified in your own outreach that, in fact, when it comes to the Argentine private sector, there would be no barriers in a Millet government and everyone would be expected to proceed as usual, in fact, you said, vamos a tener la mejor relación posible con todos los países del mundo, es simple sentido común, that you're going to have the, the best relationship with as many countries of the world as possible. It's simply common sense. My understanding is that when former President Mauricio Macri and Patricia Bullrich, the former competing candidate, formed an agreement with your campaign, one of the topics was to make sure, in fact, that Argentina would continue with this important relationship. Before I get into some specifics of the Argentina-China relationship, I just want to know kind of what the cohesive vision is for Argentina and China should Javier Millet be elected president. China is one of our main partners. They have been for a long time. Hopefully they will keep on being for a long time. What Javier was referring to is something that I know it's alien to your minds, but Argentina has secret deals. The government makes decisions with the Chinese government that are secret. What Javier meant is the government will not be doing that kind of deals. And of course, if there's any deal, it won't be secret. I mean, let me put an example. If you want to buy this pen, you can do it. Someone imported it, pay the tariffs, pay the freight, uh, there's distribution, and you get it. Now the government decides who can buy what things at what price. Now that's what we're referring to. And in many cases, uh, when you're talking with countries that do not have an open and transparent government, or at least our government is not entirely open and transparent as we would want it to be, you never know, ever know, never know, what, is, uh, what are the conditions under which certain things are done. Let me put an example now with China. Many years ago, Argentina, as a government, sold milk to Venezuela. Of course, the government has no milk. They have to buy it from somebody. So and what, under what, at what price? Under what conditions? When and if uh, the other guy pri it, it pays, how is it going to go back to the Argentine producer? There's a lot of, uh, actually, about two years ago, they went to China and they came back saying, we have signed 22 agreements. Nobody knows what those 22 agreements are. At least, I'm, I don't want to say nobody knows. We have not been able to find them. And I'm really good at Googling. And I have a lot of friends at the Foreign Relations Office. Uh, so that's what it has to stop. Definitely, it has to stop. We have a swap agreement with the central bank. Nobody knows the conditions. So when people say, oh, you're not going to, come on. We are talking stopping corruption. This is Argentine corruption, not Chinese. Maybe the Chinese also do it, I don't know. We are talking about stopping the things that are happening that everybody's going to pay. Let me put you on a, another example. Argentina has indebted itself uh, with China. We get a loan, okay. 47 million people are going to pay that loan through their taxes. Now, only a few people would get 
out of those loans, the dollars to buy whatever the government says they can buy. I'm not going to say it's illegal and under our own legal system, but it's entirely unethical. Now, when people surprise themselves and they claim that they say, and you're going to hear uh, Martinez Pandieri say, oh, we want to see a relationship with China. Absolutely not. We want to make them transparent. No government in the world should decide whether I'm buying cookies or not, at what price, where do I get them from, how do I pay for them? Do you know that the government allows certain imports if they are paid in yuan? If you have your own dollars, you cannot buy it. You have to get the uh, yuan, and you cannot get your own yuan. You get, you have to uh, get them through the government. That's what we're stopping, and it has to be made as clear as possible. The level of corruption we have there, again, not including the, uh, the the Chinese government, is the Argentine government that keeps those deals secret, and it's not only with China, mind you. We have a secret deal with Chevron, an American company, signed by this same government. Sorry, not the same government, the last reincarnation of this government. Is that so, reasonable? So, so that's, yeah, no, sorry. no. Sorry. It's very hard for me to understand why people criticize that. Give me one reason why a government should keep its agreements from the people and its defense or something really relevant. Yeah, no, so I think. From the government? Mm. No, I, it's, so it's an important distinction between doing business with China and the kinds of government to government arrangements that, that you've identified. And so what I thought I would do is maybe ask just a couple of questions secret, about- Secret government to government. Secret, government. Secret. Secret so, government. I, so I wanna ask about a couple of existing and potential government to government agreements and see how you might handle them because certainly this would be in the category I think that you've raised a lot of concerns about. One of the agreements is already in place. This is the space facility in Neuquén that the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, operates without great transparency. I have three or four, but maybe very briefly, we can go through them one at a time. I, I don't know how much the campaign has, has looked into them, but I do wonder whether Argentina's approach to, to this list will change. Let's start with the, the space facility in Neuquén. Well, unfortunately, a country is not something, it's, it's an entity that lasts longer than its leaders. We don't know what has been signed. We do know that it's secret. We only know that 10% of the time will be used for Argentine researchers. If it's a space, really a space a regulation, why keep it secret? And even if that's the case, uh, unfortunately, once an agreement has been signed, the government would have to respect it. You, you, we, we will need to find out what is in there and if it's really something that is really hurting the global community, well, we might try uh, to make some arrangements to that, to, to some changes, to do something. But so far, I have to answer in all honesty that if it's a, an agreement that the government has already signed, it is in representation of the Argentine Republic. How could a new and different government change it? And if a new and for a new government, even if the best government in the world and the other one was not, you cannot give any kind of reliability to the rest of the world if you're going to change it. So we need to know what it is about, find out not only what it entails for us, because maybe it's hurtful for Argentina, but it was signed by Argentinian leaders. Only if it hurts other communities in the world, I think we might go through the international law system to see whether it can or cannot be open. It would never be open or be a decision from the Argentine government. Let me ask a similar question regarding the reported interest of China to build a logistics facility in Ushuaia. This I don't think is as far along certainly as the operational space complex, but it seems to be something very much on the list of priorities for Beijing in its relationship with Buenos Aires. What are your views on that project? Well, it, it's a very interesting case because someone thought about it. And once you know about it, it's a marvelous idea. It can use, uh, it, it entails a lot of things. It's building a, a port in the southernmost part of uh, Argentina, very close to Antarctic. It would use gas that right now cannot be used. It would produce fertilizer that's badly needed all over the world. So it's putting together two or three things that says it makes perfect sense. 
having said that, the only port uh, very much to the south would be controlled by a foreign economy. Um, the need for for urea, that's the urea, I think it's said in English, that will be sold. What are the taxes? What are the prices that are paid on that? So I would say that once it has, everybody thought, oh, what a great idea. I think it should be open, an open bid that someone might be able or want to, um, I'm sorry, there's another one calling in the Zoom, uh, bid for it and not have just one entity do it, but many entities uh, competing for it and part, uh, putting it back into pieces. One is the port, one is the, um, the urea plant, and one is the use of the gas. Having said that, it has brought to everybody's attention the importance of the South Atlantic. And well, hopefully there won't be a, a severe drought in Panama as we had uh, recently. And you know that level of traffic came down 40%. We all know that the Northern Passage has not opened that yet and there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be built. So if really bad things happen with the Suez Canal or the Panama Canal, where there's only two ways, South Africa or Argentina or Chile to go around us. And to go around those uh, areas, well, there are uh, defense issues that uh, arise. Who and why should I have access to that? Also, it entails a lot of relationship with Antarctica. And Antarctica is, a, well, you know, we're opening up in a few years, in, in a very short time, the, um, the agreement that was signed a few, uh, many years ago. So there's a lot of things that need to be agreed on rather than have one company. The interesting thing in that case is also that it was entirely done and signed by uh, at, at the provincial level, at the state level, and not at the national level. And that's kind of surprising because how could a, one province decide on something according to our law? All uh, coasts belong to the nation, not uh, they have jurisdictions at the federal level, not at the state level. That's I want to move on. Yeah, I want to move on from China. I have two more topics. I'll combine them, which is the role of the Huawei telecommunications company in 5G infrastructure in Argentina. This has been an issue that the United States has been quite concerned about, not only in Argentina, but elsewhere in the region and the world, given concerns about access to sensitive information um, by the Chinese government and its intelligence community through the hardware that this company Huawei might install. And the other issue is nuclear power in Argentina and whether the Chinese would be part of an expansion of Argentina's civil nuclear energy sector. Maybe very briefly, if you could touch on both those topics, and then we will we'll move on to other relationships. Well, the government has sped up that, uh, that bid for 5G at an lightning speed. They are hoping to get a billion dollars for it, and they need the money, and they're going to spend the money. And even though I understand the conditions for the bid say it has to be neutral technology, I'm not certainly aware that it would be done, but it will be done under this government. And it's again, it's another thing that's kind of surprising. I, I know a government cannot be stopped because there's going to be elections because there are elections every two years. You, you have to keep going. But uh, having elections uh, three weeks from now and taking office the new government, whoever it is, on December the 10th, it's kind of surprising that they have pushed this up in such a short period of time. I. I am not familiar with the conditions that are related to foreign providers or suppliers, but the Argentine bidders of the company that will be bidding for Argentina are apparently going to be neutral. Another surprising fact is that Argentina is in no condition to install 5G right now. So what's the hurry? Let, let's move on to another important commercial relationship that seems to be somewhat in doubt, but but you'll tell me if it should be, and that's Argentina's relationship with its neighbor and, and fellow Mercosur member, Brazil. The president, you know, presidential candidate Javier Millet has expressed 
um, fairly strong opinions about the Workers' Party in Brazil, about President Lula. I, I think one of them that, that was most notable, he said, you know, lamento mucho por el pueblo brasileiro haber caído nuevamente en las manos del socialismo, that, that I, I very much regret that the Brazilian public has again fallen in the hands of socialism. Comments like that have raised questions about whether a bad personal relationship between the presidents of Brazil and Argentina could be reflected in the way Mercosur functions or doesn't function, in the way Brazilian and Argentine businesses operate, in the way that this sort of stabilizing and most important pillar of politics in South America might be affected by a potential Malay presidency. I can see from your reaction that you don't think that would be the case. I just want to give you the chance to talk a bit about how uh, Brazil and Argentina would operate. You. You work at the Wilson Center. You know that personal relationships, if they're good, they help. But if they're not good, they cannot hurt. You have to keep on going with whoever it is. Lula will stop being president one day. We don't even know whether Javier will be president two weeks from now. And what we're saying is being, and Javier is always honest. The very, very, very magnificent thing we have in this election is that we're having someone who is extremely honest, extremely transparent, and someone who is exactly the opposite. So uh, relating that as, as regards uh, Lula or any other, uh, but it, it's the citizen's decision uh, who they decide and say, yeah, I regret it whether or I like it. I get, and I congratulate the new president because you have to keep on saying the rest of the phrase. It was a congratulations to the new leader. I mean, uh, that was something that maybe had Javier been Brazilian, he would not have voted for, for Lula, but once he's the president, he's going to be there. And we are going to respect them as much as we can. And besides, they're our neighbors. And besides, our huge trade partners. And before Argentinians liked going holidays on, on Brazil. So there's no way any of those relationships can stop. Let me put it the other way around. We are souring our relationship with Paraguay right now. The government is taking some decisions that are hurting the Paraguayan people. You should ask the next speaker, uh, how come they are hurting other people on purpose? Um, yeah. We have contracts there that we have to respect the contract. That's something that we have very much ingrained in our hearts. It is, it, what is written has to be respected. Let me ask about also more broadly Mercosur. The presidential candidate Javier Millet doesn't seem to be a great admirer of Mercosur. At one point, I think he said, I que destruirlo, you have to take it apart. On the other hand, you've talked optimistically, it sounds like, about the prospects of an EU-Mercosur trade agreement, about Mercosur yeah. being the engine that Argentina uses to sign new free trade agreements around the world. You've mentioned Paraguay and Uruguay. They have had different experiences with Mercosur. Uruguay in particular has really struggled and even pursued bilateral trade agreements um, that have put at risk the, the functioning of Mercosur. So what, what's the broad vision for Mercosur under a Malay presidency? The broad, uh, broad vision under anybody. Uh, it, it is that, um, and this is what we should be correcting. Mercosur was expected to be trade creation and actually it ended up being trade deviation. You know, the concept and one thing that we are increasing the number of transactions and they say, rather than buying here, I'm buying there because there's an artificial tariff in the middle. We all, not only we have shorter distances, cultural backgrounds that are very similar, friendships, but also fright and other things are cheaper when we deal among ourselves, particularly, again, common tariffs. Um, so Mercosur should be twisted around so it helps us. Right now, this is funny. We are supposed to be a trade agreement and we are competing among each other. One kilo of meat that's sold by one of the countries is not sold by the other three. Why can't we kind of cooperate in those things? One contract with an, a supermarket abroad has to be filled in with just one country and cannot be shared among the others. If someone has a drought as we are having right now, someone else should come in and fill it up. Well, we don't have that kind of thing right now. It, it, it should be a far more collaborative, far more cooperation. Rather than competing, we compete among ourselves as regards the rest of the world. It doesn't make any sense. So uh, that those things have to be done. 
As regards the other agreements, as I said, the leverage with the EU and EFTA and all the other potential uh, agreements that we might have, it's we are using the knowledge of four countries. We are sure. showing the world we are a big community that needs, uh, it's not only that we're a lot of people, we have huge infrastructure needs. We can collaborate among each other. We can share a lot of resources. So that's why it's attractive to have Mercosur uh, a deal. And you can split the cost of the negotiation among different people. Particularly for the uh, for other countries, it's very expensive to be considering all these things individually. So that's that should be the spirit that we share resources, uh, knowledge resources, and that we can uh, work together. Now, if one country is going to do the things at the expense of the others, that doesn't work. Let me put you another example. Uh, there used to be not so long ago a clause that says that if one of the four countries missed some part of the agreement all four were punished. Now that's moral hazard for you because it, the, the reason the, the, the reasoning behind it was if country A does something wrong, B, C, and D will try to stop them from doing that. Well, that's in principle, but what has it really happened if country A does not comply and B, C, and D are going to suffer the consequences, well, B, C, and D will also not comply. And actually, you should have, if A is doing something wrong, well, get A punished and leave the business for B, C, and D. So they would be looking at what they are doing because they want to get back the business. Now, it's entirely wrong the way it was done. Now it's being corrected. But um, those kind of things, when you look at them from an economic perspective and not a, a negotiation that is based on other principles, then you can speed up things a lot. You can get things done and you agree on who's paying what cost much, much faster. That's something that we hope we can impose on almost other treaties that everybody benefits rather than benefits for doing the right thing, mm -hmm. rather than right now that you benefit for not doing the right thing. Another initiative for greater integration of Argentina, though, though not a free trade agreement or a customs union, is membership in the BRICS. This is the relatively new international grouping involving Brazil, Russia, India, South Africa. It is now contemplating a rather large expansion. And one of the countries that's been invited after insistence for many years would be Argentina. Uh, as I said, it's not an economic arrangement, though there is the new development bank, which theoretically could offer a new source of development finance for Argentina. Both Patricia Bullrich, who then was a center-right candidate, and Javier Millet reacted during the campaign very negatively and dismissively, saying that this was not the appropriate grouping for Argentina. And presumably, the suggestion was Argentina wouldn't accept membership if either of them were elected. Patricia is no longer a candidate, but Javier, of course, is. So let me ask. Has there been any new thinking about whether Argentina would accept membership in the BRICS grouping should Javier Millet become president in December? Well, actually, it was a very surprising decision. Nobody knew about it. And my understanding was actually negotiation overnight. Um, so it was well, things that are so relevant for a whole society should be discussed more openly. Having said that, I think the whole... Um, impetus for, for it, or as you were Benjamin saying, is to get a new and additional law from the NDB, the New Development Bank. Now, assuming that that could be something relevant, where would that money be used for? Where would it go? I leave that aside again. What is the purpose of participating in one group or the other? If we're saying that we should be open to the world. If we're saying we have to work as closely as possible with as many countries as possible. What's the purpose? As far as I know, the BRICS had very few things in common and they were actually identified by people who say, hey, these are the, 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 the markets where there's huge potential because of size, because of politics, because there's a, um, it is attractive for a, all sorts of different kinds of trade. Well, it is certainly very important to say, hey, me too. I also want to participate, but if we want to become a 15 country member, what is your differentiation with the, with the other 14? So uh, that, again, that's another thing to be considered. Right now, apparently there are not, neither obstacles, no, nothing really relevant 
to be a member of. And so if and when we know the conditions, I'm willing to take a look into it. My gut feeling is in the dire economic situation Argentina is right now, why bother? It's not anything against the BRICS, definitely not. It is of the memberships, etc. Other people say, well, you know, Iran, who, uh, there are some in that group and the others. Uh, I wouldn't get into that. I, I would just say, what is the purpose for Argentina to spend even more money to appoint someone to deal with that? What's the benefit for us? Okay, so just to clarify, no firm position on, on BRICS membership, but you don't no, no, have no. a great amount of right now, right now, it's a firm position. It's a no. It's a but no. I, okay. Show something that makes it interesting and we might recognize it. But so, so far, with the relevant information that is publicly available, there doesn't seem to be nothing that makes it enticing. We've we've talked now quite a bit about some world leaders and countries that um, would not necessarily be on the list of priorities for, for Javier Millet's foreign policy. I want to turn to the countries that he's expressed a particular interest in. Um, these are countries that are, as you've referred to, are liberal democracies, countries that Javier Millet would see as natural allies. He frequently mentions Israel, he mentions the United States. So I figure let's start with the United States. I'm, of course, speaking to you from Washington I right now. I should have the European Union, so otherwise they get jealous. But and I'm, the European we're, Union as we're well. We're talking liberal democracies in general. Yeah. No, no, no. An, an important clarification, and we should talk about the EU again. We've referenced it in terms of trade with Mercosur. Um, the sense that the United States and Javier Millet would, would have opportunities to build partnerships makes complete sense to me. Um, I think they would have a, a lot in common, particularly the skepticism about, you know, some of China's influence in Latin America, the opportunities to work on energy and, and food security, on critical minerals. It, it's a quite a long list, issues that already are on the bilateral agenda and certainly could be the subject for, for closer relations. I want to just raise a couple of issues, though, that might make some distance between the United States and, and a Malay administration, just so you have a full opportunity to address how you would work around them, through them, how you might clarify the, the candidates' views. One of them is simply kind of where Millet would see himself in geopolitics in terms of ideology, because there are many who want to refer to him as kind of a traditional figure on the far right, his relationships with Eduardo Bolsonaro, the former Brazilian president's son, with Jose Antonio Cast of Chile, with the Vox Party of Spain. With... Don't waste your time. Don't waste oh. your time. I, I just I just want to give you the opportunity because I know you don't see it this way, but it's certainly a very common question that I know I'm asked about Javier Millet, which is, would he see himself among that group? And if so, would that make it a challenge to get along with the White House that's currently led by, by President Joe Biden? Definitely not. We hope that we will be doing some common sense politics, what's done all in many of the countries that have already developed. How would... I'm going to mention a few ones. Why would, on earth would that consider extreme right? I, I, I just can't fathom. I mean, fortunately, some people have asked this question before. And to me, it's, why it's so strange that people would be able to say it? Why is it so difficult to understand that the government cannot decide what hours you're opening your, your business, or how many days of holidays you can give your employees? You can put a minimum on the days of holidays for employees. That I agree with but only the minimum. Uh, how come people, uh, the government decides what the interest rate should be paid on everything? Not only on a loan, but also on a term deposit. How come the government can decide when you buy something, how long it takes that you can sell it back again? And it's not whether you sell it very soon, you, you pay a certain taxes, you sell it very, on a limited time, you pay a lower tax. No, 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 no. It just says you cannot buy a bond and sell it back unless five days have passed and you have to do it with the same. Yeah, so, so Diana, so just in, in, in speaking about kind of his economic philosophy, what kinds of world leaders, what groups of world leaders, you know, what figures would you compare him to? If not Bolsonaro, Donald Trump, these sort of traditional list you hear, Jose Antonio Cast in Chile, yeah, well, where do you place him? I wouldn't compare him to anybody. What I do believe is that Argentina needs I'm not saying Javier is that person, but Argentina needs is someone to understand what the challenges are and how to get them done. So if I could, and again, I'm not 
having uh, Javier say it's that, it's a mixture of Churchill and Reagan. Uh, you have to change the focus of the world, make the people understand what is it that we are fighting for? What is it that we are do not want to become? What is it we are leaving behind and have to get it done? That's what we need. And Javier has that kind of personality and a way of communicating that's very nice for young people, not so nice to older people like me. Uh, but if you understand what he says, oh my God. And to everybody who says, uh, by the way, uh, says, oh, I don't like Javier. Like, he's crazy here and he shouts, read what he says. Read what he has written. See, try to find one thing whether he has changed uh, the approach in the last 10 years. It doesn't mean that he will not uh, focus in the economic arena. We have discussed a lot of things that we should go this way or the other, a lot of trade-offs. And he very easily understands those, those trade-offs. Uh, well, you have to make a decision someday. But um, compare it uh, to someone, yes, uh, probably Georgia Meloni, that everybody was frightened about her. And now it's everybody loves her. Oh, not everybody. But um, it's probably that kind of thing. The kind of things that Javier is accused of is lack of governability. I was always appalled by that. But right now, with uh, under this ballotage idea, where we are going to, uh, we have a lot of, people not only voting for that, but a lot of people from other parties that we are all working together. Can anybody talk about governability again? I mean, it would be pretty obvious whether we can or cannot, I don't know. But this was a dated against Goliath uh, until one week ago, okay? It, it was people with against the whole apparatus from the government with zero, um, I'm not going to say what I was going to say, but uh, with uh, no restrictions on what they could say and how much money they spent, outright lies in public television. And we were trying to say what we wanted to say through social networks, and that was the most that we could do. Now, after the, the election, a lot of people, including Junta por el Cambio, Patricia Bullrich that you mentioned, uh, she came forward and said, hey, we have something bigger to work for right now. So I think if Javier can get all those people together. I hope. Let me just, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna group together a couple of other issues that I know would be of a major interest to the United States just to see how it would affect the broader relationship. And maybe you could go through them just one by one. One of them is environmental protection and, and climate change. This has come up a great deal. Um, this idea that that Millet sometimes refers to climate change as a mentira socialista, a socialist lie. This is a, a priority for the Biden White House. And I, I can't imagine that it wouldn't come up if there were conversations between President Biden and, and a President Millet. Another is on Argentina's role defending human rights, particularly in the region, particularly in places like Venezuela. Um, this current government has not been very consistent on that. You have been asked about that, and you've said that you think the best role is to lead by example. And so I would just give you an opportunity to clarify what, if any, role Argentina would have in, in pressing for better respect for human rights in places like Nicaragua and, and Cuba and, and Venezuela. And then the other two I would put on the list are Ukraine and the regional response to, to Russia's invasion and what's happening in, in Israel and in the, the conflict with Hamas and Gaza. Those would be the four, all of them complex. I mm -hmm. want to go through them quickly if we can. I have a few other questions, so please do. I, I, and in just eight minutes, okay. <laughs> well, the, the easiest one, human rights, of course, we're liberals. I'm sorry, liberals, Argentina, stand which want me closer to libertarians in the US or I mean, the liberal idea of David Hume, uh, Rousseau, that kind of thing, okay? So there's no discussion that we will fully respect human rights and we'll do our best as regards that. According to international law, I mean, there's there's no, not a hint of suspicion for that. And we will not be twisting it or saying, oh, this is not the right time, etc. as is right now happening. Let me go to the climate change issue. Uh, what Javier has said is not, he doesn't believe it's anthropomorphic, but you have to differentiate, very strongly differentiate the, what are the reasons uh, why somebody thinks something is happening and what are the outcomes. If whether or not there is climate change, anthropomorphic climate change, Argentina is the best opportunity the world has, not only Argentina, the world has to fight it. We are the biggest carbon sink in the world. 
we can expand our agricultural area and even with what we already have right now, we grow pastures. Pastures have photosynthesis that are much, much faster, far more efficient than woods. These things are analyzed and studied in the Northern Hemisphere where you have oak woods and things like that that take years to grow, etc. You can grow them much faster in Argentina, in the Mesopotamia, but even far better than that is pastures. We can do pastures that every six months you can renew them. And not only it's a huge carbon sink, it is something that can be eaten up by either people or uh, animal feed. I mean, cows, sheep, horse, goats, whatever you want. So we would be helping food security for the world and helping on the climate arena. If there is a, a climate uh, real worry, well, hopefully, help us do it. Stop this, the subsidies that are hurting us. That would be one answer. The other thing, is, if it's not, why not do it anyway? Why couldn't we have that carbon sink immediately? I can also talk about our energy transition matrix that we are not as Uruguay, that's 100% renewables, but we can have an extremely good, um, it's actually it's one or 2% that uh, comes from, from oil right now. Uh, the rest is gas that's now considered green, uh, wind, and a hydroelectric, and a little bit of nuclear. So our energy matrix is very, very uh, green. And other countries like China and India just, are just, just, don't just, impose on those yeah, things. We have to move on, but just if I could summarize and okay. tell me if, if I have it yeah, correct. It's all right. No, no, it no, doesn't no. matter how, it doesn't matter what any of our leaders believe. We if anybody believes in it we can do it. If nobody believes in it, not. I don't care. It is good for our country. It is good for the world, whether or not we do a, have a climate crisis. Uh, the fourth one was, or the third and fourth, uh, um, Israel and Palestine, I think. We have to consider Hamas as a terrorist uh, group. A, we, we differentiate the Palestinian people from Hamas. That's something that I don't see too many other countries making that difference. For us, it is very, very relevant. For the Libertad Avanza, uh, Hamas has to be separated from or as analyzed differently than what you analyze the Palestinian people. And you were talking about nuclear, the fourth question was? U Ukraine and Russia. Ukraine and Russia. Um, is there any other way of saying that's close to a genocide, what's going on there? I mean, uh, there may be territorial disputes. Is that the way to solve them? It is very hard to understand how a conflict like that can keep on going for 18 months already. The damage it has been doing for everybody, loss of lives, etc. Is that the way to claim your, your territory that you think it's yours? I think uh, Russia made a huge mistake. I think uh, Ukraine, is doing a valiant effort. I don't know what they succeed with it. The cost is going huge, not only in lives, but in, in economic resources. We have to be very careful. And on that, Argentina can help on a variety of issues. And in the next conversation, I can let you know how. Well, well I, am, I am curious in just the few minutes we have left about what role, if any, Argentina really should play in addressing some of these issues. As you know, before the war, but just before, Argentina's president was in Moscow and, and offering Argentina as the, the open door to Latin America through which you know Russia could increase its presence and influence. It sounds like you're taking a much more critical view of Russia's conduct since its invasion of neighboring Ukraine. What role, if any, might, might Argentina play then in, in isolating Russia, in punishing it for its conduct, in, in bringing hostilities to an end? Um, same question, perhaps, for, for the way you might support Israel, it sounds like, um, as you would like to do in its conflict with Hamas in, in Gaza. So, so the question is, and also even on human rights, which you referenced earlier, in terms of a clear view on human rights, but I didn't hear kind of what the policies might look like. So in all of these areas, very quickly, what would be the role of Argentina in addressing areas of importance to the international community and certainly to the United States? We have definitely to differentiate among the present government uh, what a uh, Libertad Avanza government would be. That's for sure. Having said that, a country is a country. The Republic does not change, as I mentioned before. 
uh, the leaders can change, but uh, whatever has been done and said, if it's in writing, it should be, uh, if it's an agreement, it should be respected. As far as I know, nothing has been signed with Russia. And I was going to make a joke that God forbid, but that maybe it's not the relevant place to do that. Uh, but we are willing to be, we, are, we have to be open to everybody within a strong respect for all international law, respecting Argentinian values and interests. What value would we share with that kind of thing? Our Occidental values are Argentinian. What would we share with them? What would our interest be in that? I find it hard to understand, very hard to understand. It was very unfortunate that that meeting was a week before the, the invasion, but even if, it, even if there had not been any invasion, why would you be willing to uh, subdue uh, under one circumstance and not to the other? Uh, I mean, we have to have the same set of rules for everybody. It cannot be that hard to understand. We have to abide by the same rules with everybody. And we have to stop this dis uh, um, discretionality that we've had for 40 years now. We have to stop that, 70 years now. I've gotten a few questions from the audience. We have three minutes, so I won't get to, to all of them. There was a specific question about the Inflation Reduction Act, which provides benefits to companies using either domestic inputs for batteries and electric vehicles and, and green energy technologies, or inputs that come from countries with which the United States has a free trade agreement. You can tell where I'm getting uh, to here. Argentina doesn't receive these benefits. And so the lithium that Argentina is increasingly producing, which is needed for batteries and all of these technologies, doesn't receive any of these incentives when it's purchased by American manufacturers. I don't know, it's a bit of a technical question, but have you and your team looked into ways that Argentina might receive Inflation Reduction Act benefits for its lithium exports to the United States. All I can say, we strongly believe that we have, are all equal under the law. We would certainly expect that we are considered the same way. There was a question, Diana, about an allegation that China might be intervening in this election and that China might be supporting your adversaries in the Peronist Party and supporting the Sergio Massa campaign. Is that an accusation that your campaign is making? And if so, is there evidence that you'd be comfortable sharing about what role, if any, you see China playing in this election in Argentina? I saw that in social media. Actually, someone found out that the advertisers were all Chinese companies, and that's kind of weird. And actually, the amount of money that had been, you know, when you enter into Facebook and all the, in the other social media, you can find out who's paying. There's a complete transparency. And it was very surprising. Why would they care? And why would they spend so much money into certain? And all the advertising was only of very specific items. Now, is that illegal? I don't think so. Is that a complicated situation? It certainly is. We, we can't end any conversation about Argentina without mentioning the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. It's practically a law. Um, so then let's talk about the IMF before we finish here. Obviously, if you were foreign minister, if Javier Millet were president, you would inherit this more than $40 billion in debt to the IMF and a rather complex relationship, a program that doesn't appear to be working um, and so might require a renegotiation, which I think would be the what 23rd program in Argentina's history with the IMF. What would be your approach to, to that relationship, to this particular program um, that Argentina has, and whether you would see this as you know, conditions to minimize, as the current government has, or rather an opportunity to bring about you know, broad structural reform, which has been part of the, the campaign so far? So your vision for Argentina and the IMF, and then I promise I'll let you go. You've been very generous with your time. I can maybe joke that that's why I'm moving into the foreign relations and leave that to the economy. <laughs> Having said that, Having said, we don't know if the program works because it has never been respected by the authorities we have. They signed on a Monday and on Thursday, they're already doing something different. Okay. Again, the total debtness or indebtedness Argentina has is slightly over our GDP, uh, but out, out of that total, slightly under 20% is IMF and all other multilateral agreements, okay? So you cannot blame 20% of the debt on 
the problems we are having, particularly because not really paying the debt. We are taking debt with one hand to pay the other. So that is not necessarily um, the biggest problem. By the way, we know the latest payment will be paid by, uh, we know what the interest rate for the IMF program is. We don't know what the interest rate for the new lender is. So maybe we're paying, uh, we're paying cheap debt with more expensive debt. I don't know. We certainly would have to respect the, the IMF agreement, same as everybody else. Uh, that's something that is very hard and people say, oh no, you're putting IMF on top of other people, on your people. Well, not. Because uh, when you're not eligible for, for any further debt and you keep on having the huge deficits that we are having in Argentina, the only way to pay them is through monetary expansion. And we know the inflation we're having. Do you know what the interest rate is right now on a compound basis? It's almost 300%, 297. I don't want to exaggerate. So we are paying 297% interest rate on pesos because no one will, uh, will lend us dollars at five, six, seven percent? Is that a really good answer? Now, I, I think that our economic policy is actually upwards and we have to change it. And IMF and everybody else should be respected. And no matter what happens in this election, you will be a member of Congress. And so you will have the opportunity to pursue a lot of these policy areas. We're so thrilled that you joined us again. This was really enriching conversation for us. And I'm I'm certain for a very large audience in Argentina and the United States and elsewhere, um, this is a new political party. Javier Millet is a relatively new political figure. And so we're all still getting to know him and his worldview and, and the priorities he would bring to the Casa Rosada and that you would bring to the uh, Palacio San Martin. This was very, very helpful in, in that effort. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. And if La Libertad Avanza wins, you should come to Argentina two, three years from now. You will not recognize it. It will be wonderful. Thank you very much. I hope I won't have to wait that long. Well, no, <laughs> if you come two months from now, we're not having able to do much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Diana.